Mm -hmm. um, so I'm Gwen Clayton. Thanks very much, um, Romy, for inviting me to talk to you this evening. It's really nice to be here and um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm a, a freelance translator working from Japanese and German into English. Um, my mother was German and I studied Japanese at university. Uh, I've spent about eight years living and working in Japan. Um, I've never lived in Germany, but I had a lot of childhood holidays there. Um, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to sort of bring my interests together. And uh, Romy was very encouraging. So that's uh, that's what you've got. Um, the Let's see. So sorry, I'm just fiddling around with my screen, trying, trying to get the best... Uh, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. best way well, to look yeah. at it I mean if you wish we can actually start yep and let's see if somebody comes or not I'm recording okay. that you know and then so that we have I will actually I will just mute everyone because how, how does this work actually uh, so our guest Gwen she will start then we listen and at the end we have then a discussion, right? But Walter, can you help and uh, introduce a little bit what happens here? Oh, there are a lot of people are coming in. Ah, yeah. Do you want me to introduce myself? Or? No, to tell how it works here at our sessions. Yes, usually we have a presentation of about 30 or 40 minutes. So um, I actually understand that we actually also have started. And then afterwards, about 20, 25 minutes, we, we're talking with each other. And uh, uh, we are, we're giving our impressions or, or asking questions. So yeah. I think uh, yeah, it's, it will uh... be very interesting today. Maybe we're going to have a lack of time <laughs> because it's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's because they're interesting. So yeah. yes, I'm 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 uh, quite uh, yes um, curious. Me too. Curious. Yes. Yeah, so so imagine this would be live event, and then it's like networking, uh, networking. You know, gathering together, sharing opinions. It's um, it's a bit familiar. You know, it's it's not like super official, but the point is, you know, to learn learn from each other and you know um, share our feedback opinions so what i'll do i'll just now mute everybody apart from gwen i'll mute myself as well and then then we will see at the end uh we we can then start with conversation with when gwen is finished so when it's totally now the you know the stage is yours and great be here okay Lovely. Thanks very much. Um, so thanks again for having me and um, uh, welcome everyone. And it's really nice to be here. Um, so this evening, I want to take you on a virtual journey to look at Japan and Germany and some of the things that they have in common. Um, it will be a little bit superficial in places because time was not on my side. I'm a busy translator. Um, but I hope to show you a few interesting things and maybe some things that you didn't know or that didn't occur to you before. Um, I should say uh, I'm not a historian. I'm not an academic. I'm not an economist. I'm just someone who's got a sort of lifelong interest in Japan. Um, so here is my outline. I'm sort of treating this like a, a relationship, sort of when Harry met Sally type thing. Um, the talk is intended to be a light-hearted look at how Japan and Germany see each other, um, but also a bit of a more serious glance at how the apparent similarity might have come about. Um, uh, that does seem to have been a mutual interest between the two countries going back quite a long way into history. Um, and I want to look at this uh, through the lives of five men that I've chosen who I think are sort of symbolic of the relationship. There are three Germans and, and two Japanese men that we'll meet in a minute. Um, there's also the shared history between the two countries, particularly in the 20th century, which um, Romy touched on, I think, right at the beginning there, um, uh, both bad times and good times, extraordinary 
economic success, which I will touch on briefly. Um, and then, well, we'll see where we get to. Uh, yeah, so much in common, right? Um, so I went to Japan in my gap year. I was uh, 19. I'd finished school and I had a place at university waiting um, to study Japanese. And I went to live with a Japanese family in a quite a rural part of Japan. Um, and somehow I felt at home very quickly. And at the time I wondered why this was. And I sort of explained it to myself because it there were these similarities with places that I'd been to um, earlier in my life. Um, and it did remind me of Germany, actually. They were very organized. There were lots of societies and, and sort of jobs were shared out in a really logical way. Um, people knew what was happening when the rubbish was going to be collected and all those sorts of things were really nicely done. Um, and I found out very quickly, there's a right way of doing things in Japan, just like you know, there might be in Germany. So if you're hanging out, you're washing, you've got to do it by a certain time. Otherwise, the neighbors are going to say, all oh, those lazy people, they're hanging out, they're washing too late. And, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, a sort of concern about what, what other people think and, and, and that type of stuff. Um, as I spent more and more time in Japan, I realized that there were there were other things that were common, um, a love of hiking and, and outdoors. And um, that in both countries, people seem to socialize by going for walks. There are uh, like walking groups and hiking societies and um, lots of outdoor gear and that type of stuff. But also um, beer, uh, local festivals, um, local customs and traditional dress in different parts of the country, which again, I think is it's much more pronounced in, in Germany perhaps Austria as well, but in England, we've sort of lost that a little bit. Um, but uh, let me say a few words about beer, and hence the picture on the slide, um, because uh, the arrival of beer drinking in Japan sort of mirrors the journey of lots of other Western habits uh, into that country. Um, so currently, beer is the most popular alcoholic drink in Japan. It represents about two thirds of the alcohol drunk. And... Um, it's mainly Pilsner style lager, and it's a firm feature of Japanese drinking culture um, and Japanese social events. So if there are toasts, it's always beer. <laughs> drinking competitions, usually beer. Um, uh, beer was first introduced by the Dutch traders during the Edo period. Um, the Edo period is also known as the Tokugawa period um, after the Tokugawa shoguns. Um, and this lasted from 1603 to 1868. Uh, it was a time of peace and huge cultural flowering, but also isolation from the rest of the world. The closed country edict of, 60, of uh, 1635 prevented Japanese people from leaving Japan and they would return on, on pain of death, basically. Um, the one exception was that the Dutch were allowed to have a trading station in Dejima, which is a small island um, in the Nagasaki Harbour. Um, and uh, so there was this just this little window through which uh, ideas were exchanged during these 250 years. Um, and uh, so beer was one of the things that the Dutch brought. Um, beer became more widely available when Japan opened its doors to the outside world in the 1860s um, and uh, sort of during the Meiji period, which is 1868 to 1912, um, brewers started to arrive in Japan from Germany and other places. Japan's major breweries, of which there are four, three of them, I'm sure you'll be familiar with um, Kirin, Sapporo and Asai. Um, they were all established around about this time. So that was the story of beer. Um, there's also this mutual interest. Uh, it's not just me saying, hmm, these two countries are sort of similar. Um, in Japan, uh, people are very interested in, in, in Germany. And I think to a certain extent, it's it's reciprocated. Um, so if you go to the Japanese version of Amazon and just type in Japan and Germany, it throws up any number of books 
comparing the two countries. Um, for example, work ethic, industrial strategy, education policy, um, you know, child rearing, so many different things uh, pop up straight away. Um, and the books that I browse through, my favorite one, um, which sort of says it all, is by this 26 year old student, um, uh, Shion Am Amamiya, who uh, wrote a book called The Japanese and the Germans. If you compare them, there's little to choose. Um, subtitled, similar, turned out to be a big fat lie. <laughs> and uh, this girl goes to study in Germany thinking, She's basically going to be in the same country, but in Europe, um, and she details all her all her little surprises. Uh, but um, I think to be even just writing a book like that, uh, it, it, it says a lot about how the countries are sort of similar in people's minds. Um, obviously, this is all quite trivial, but there's a serious side to the relationship as well. Um, and now I want to talk about these five men. Uh, you'll see from the names, uh, three of them are German and, and two of them are Japanese. Um, again, this is a massive simplification of hundreds of years of exchange, people going back and forth. Um, but sometimes with history, it's helpful to break things down into what we can imagine and also what we can talk about in, in sort of 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to start with Engelbert Kempfer, um, who was a German naturalist, uh, physician, explorer, and writer, uh, sort of typical product of 17th century, I suppose. Um, he spent time in Japan, 1690 to 1692, and wrote two really important books. Uh, one I'm going to mispronounce, Armeni Tatum Exoticarum, containing his Flora Japonica, the first extensive description of Japanese plants, and also a history of Japan, uh, which was the main source of Western knowledge about Japan from then for the next hundred years. Um, so this was a huge, huge contribution to the world's knowledge and understanding of Japan. Um, he studied medicine in Poland and Russia. He traveled to Sweden. He joined the Swedish ambassador traveling to Russia and Persia. From there, he joined the Dutch East India Company, which seems to be the only reliable way to get to Japan at this period of history. Um, he spent some time in um, Batavia, Indonesia, and then he set out for Japan in 1690 to become the physician to the Dutch East India Company based in Dejima in Nagasaki, where we've just been. Um, and by doing this, he virtually became a sort of honorary Dutch um, and he was allowed to join the annual procession of um, the Dutch traders from Dejima to Edo, uh, modern day Tokyo. Um, I was curious about this journey, so I put it into Google Maps and it's just over a thousand kilometers. I imagine it takes quite a long time or it would have done um, under the conditions that he would have been traveling. So it's a huge thing to be part of. You'll see on my slide in the bottom right hand corner, there's uh, a picture of a court. Um, can you see a large open room? And that's actually Kempfer doing a dance performance to the emperor um, with uh, everybody sitting around the edge there. Um, he made two visits to the Shogun during his two years um, to accompany the Dutch procession. Um, but uh, it, it's interesting also what he brought back. So he brought ginkgo biloba seeds to Utrecht Botanical Garden, and those trees are still growing there. He collected information on acupuncture and moxibustion, which is similar to acupuncture, but involves burning mugwort leaves, different parts of your body. Um, it's essentially traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and he came back to the Netherlands and or Holland and de delivered lots of um, treatises and presentations and really had a, a big impact on um, European knowledge about Far Eastern medicine in that period. Uh, he made a good impression. He was tactful and diplomatic. Um, and because his medical skills were so respected, he was able to collect a lot of information to take home. 
He left in 1692, um, returning to Lemgor as a physician in 1694. After his death, uh, Sir Hans Sloan, he of Sloan Square, um, the botanist and collector, he bought the manuscripts that Kempfer had um, not managed to publish during his lifetime. He sent for them, gave them to his Swiss librarian, Johann Kasper Scheuchter, um, who translated them into English, and they were published in two volumes. The existing German version is actually a back translation from this original English translation, which um, I thought was an interesting quirk. The original manuscripts are at the British Library uh, in London. Um, and there on the top right of my slide is the frontispiece and the, the cover, uh, the, the inside of his big book. Um, he was succeeded in Dejima by Philip Franz von Siebold. And if there are any gardeners in the audience, you probably recognize his name because he uh, made a huge contribution to horticulture and there are lots of plants named after him. Um, Siebold is another German physician, natural scientist and plant collector. He spent eight years in Japan, also during the Tokugawa period. Um, and he was recognized for introducing Western medicine to Japan. Um, he also made last collections of plants and brought a lot of them home. Uh, he's from Würzburg. He studied medicine, um, also went to Holland and joined the military as a doctor and eventually joined the Dutch East India Company um, and got himself posted to Dejima as I said, the only way to reach Japan, really, as a foreigner at the time. Um, he was a successful doctor and um, as a sort of uh, reward, he was given free reigns to treat um, patients in the vicinity, which meant he could indulge his passion for collecting plants. Um, he set up a school in his home um, to pass on medical knowledge and teach Dutch to the local Japanese students and in turn got the students to help him collect plants um, and paint them and uh, put together his uh, flora. Um, he was actually expelled from Japan in 1829 for obtaining maps of Japan, which were not supposed to be in the hands of Westerners. They accused him of treason and spying and, um, and sent him home. But uh, he managed to take his complete collection of 2,000 plants, which he left at the Botanical Garden in Java. Um, he took his seeds back to um, Leiden and set up a herbarium there, which is still very successful, and published a seven-volume encyclopedia over the next 50 years. Um, setting out all his information about Japan. So again, a massive contribution to um, our knowledge about Japan in the West uh, when at a time when Japan was really off limit, literally off limits to uh, foreigners. 30 years later, he was allowed to return to Japan and became an ambassador for a couple of years before going back to Germany. Um, and it, here are some of his pictures. Uh, the top right is a hydrangea that's, um, I think, one of the plants that he brought back, the big leaf hydrangea. Um, at the bottom right there, he is in um, Dejima, looking out over Nagasaki Harbour, and there's a rather nice crab, looks like a spider crab, Carcinoplex longimana, that was drawn for him for inclusion in one of his books. Um, okay, so a Japanese chap now, Yasunori Takeuchi, who lived uh, a little bit later. Um, he was part of the first Japanese embassy to Europe. So there was movement in the other direction. Um, as soon as just Japan opened its doors, uh, he was sent by the Tokugawa Shogunate in 1862. Um, and he was a group of 40 men who sailed by um, ship to Europe. Um, and their aims were to learn about Western civilization and to delay the opening of Japan to foreign trade. They were Japan was under a lot of pressure at the time to open up all its different harbors and um, they were sent to sort of negotiate a slowing down of this. 
Um, the mission was concluded in 1862 by a protocol which allowed them to keep their harbours closed for another five years. So it, it didn't achieve much, but I suppose they came home um, thinking that they'd uh, they'd done what they set out to do. Here's a lovely um, illustration from uh, the Illustrated London News of them visiting the International Exhibition in London in 1862. Um, and I have to say, although the stated aim was to store Western contact with Japan, I have a feeling that by going there in their formal attire um, and, uh, you know, doing all their learning at the fair and bringing everything home, they probably stimulated exchange, certainly between England and Japan, more than slowing it down. Um, then we have another German, Albert Mosse. Um, he was a judge and a legal scholar, and he worked on the Meiji Constitution. So he was really important for the Japanese. Um, he was born in Gretz in Prussia and studied law in Berlin, um, eventually becoming a judge of the state court there. In 1882, he was asked by the German government to meet with the future Japanese Prime Minister, Ito Hirobumi or Hirobumi Ito, I should say, um, and his group of government officials who were at the time touring Europe to research different forms of government used by the different countries in Europe. Um, and it was um, Mose who convinced the Japanese future prime minister that the Prussian star government was the right one. Um, he That's him there in the photograph, sitting down, playing with his buttons. Um, on the next slide, there you have on the right, the imperial order to dispatch the mission head plenipotentiary Ito to Europe to study constitutional forms of government. And on the right is the order of the rising sun bestowed um, by the Meiji emperor on um, Albert Mosse. So he was invited to Japan um, on a three-year contract as foreign advisor to help them draw up their constitution Imagine what a job that was. Um, and then he stayed on as cabinet advisor to the Home Ministry and helped establish the draft laws and systems for local government in Japan. Um, now, I have it on uh, good faith from a, uh, another legal translator, a colleague of mine, that it's much easier to translate Japanese laws into German than into English because um, a lot of the vocabulary terminology and, in fact, concepts that we have in modern Japanese law actually have come from Germany. So you've got that kind of shared shared language there already. Um, so he was actually one of many Germans employed by the Japanese government at this time, as they were desperately trying to modernize and catch up with the rest of the world after this 250 year period of isolation. Um, particularly, they were keen to have people who specialized in science, medicine, law, and the military, um, and in Tokyo at the time, there was a Society for the Propagation of German Sciences. So gives you an idea. Um, the Japanese army at, the at that stage was very deliberately modeled on the Prussian army. And do dozens of Japanese students and officers were sent over to Prussia to spend time there in the 1890s. Um, he left Japan, uh, went back to Königsberg, became a Supreme Court judge having left a, a, a huge legacy, huge contribution in Japan. Um, so my last uh, tap is Mori Ogai, who um, is, if you even look at a list of sort of best of Japan, most important Japanese authors who will undoubtedly be on it. Um, Ogai spanned uh, the period between the end of the Tokugawa shogunate and the Meiji period, even living a little bit beyond the Meiji emperor. And it really has a foot in both periods. Um, he was from a samurai family. He studied medicine um, and began a career as an army surgeon. He was one of the people sent to Germany by the Meiji government to study over there and uh, studied military hygiene under Robert Koch. Um, he got interested in European philosophy and literature, and when he returned to Japan, he sort of set about modernizing medicine as well as literature in Japan. 
um, hugely talented across a number of different fields, quite an amazing person. Um, he became one of the most important Japanese authors of the late 19th century. Um, many of his works are concerned with this conflict between Western culture um, with its emphasis on the individual and the person who doesn't conform, maybe the kind of bit of an anti-hero um, and, and Japanese literature, which was very much about um, traditional Japanese values of family loyalty and cultural obligations and being part of a society, being a good person in society. Um, he also made the first Japanese translations of works by Goethe, Schiller, Ibsen, Hans Christian Andersen, um, and introduced modern literary criticism to Japan. And on my other slide, I have the manga version of Mori Ogai, who's one of the main characters in a manga series, Bungo Stray Dogs, which is very popular at the moment. Um, in the middle there, that's the handwritten manuscript from The Dancing Girl, which is a book he wrote about a relationship between a German girl and a Japanese student in Berlin, loosely based on his own experiences does not have a happy ending sorry for that um and then that's the house that he grew up in you can see it's a very smart samurai dwelling um from another era okay so we're in the 20th century now um there isn't time to look in huge detail um at it but uh as you probably know um japan and germany were in opposing sides in world war one and then on the same side, although other ends of the world in World War II, they're both defeated and they're both occupied by the US. Um, after Japan's defeat in World War II, the US led the Allies in the occupation um, and Japan was occupied for seven years from 1945 to 1952. Um, Douglas MacArthur and the Supreme Command of Allied Powers had various objectives including um, convening war crimes trials and dismantling Japanese army, preventing former officers taking military um, political roles, stabilizing the economy, um, creating a free market capitalist system, and concluding a peace treaty. Um, the Americans effectively uh, imposed a new con constitution on Japan, um, which took away the special status of the emperor um, and renounced Japan's right to wage war, uh, eliminating all non-defensive armed forces. Japan's involvement in Japan's uh, US involvement came to an end with the Treaty of San Francisco in 1951. Um, but with the Japan-US Security Treaty, Japan effectively gave permission for tens of thousands of American soldiers to be based in Japan indefinitely. This was been revised several times. Um, over the subsequent years, um, and it's always been a really complicated issue. Um, as will be familiar to everybody here, I'm sure Japan, Germany was also occupied and administered by the Allies from 1945 to 1949. Um, Germany was stripped of its sovereignty and former statehood. But the picture in Germany is much more complex, obviously, because you have um, different zones, that were uh, allocated to the different allies and also the division of Germany into West and East, which I don't have time to go into here, interesting as it is. Um, both countries, following their complete annihilation in World War II, um, have experienced economic miracles. And this isn't something I'd really thought about before preparing for this talk. Um, but this rapid economic growth took part uh, in Japan. It's very well known, um, sort of in the 50s and 60s, but carrying on, actually carrying on into the 90s when the bubble finally burst. Um, factors I've read about include expansion of industrial production, the development of the domestic market, an aggressive export policy, the Korean War, um, creating demand for Japanese goods, and of course, um, goes without saying, the fact that they have a zero defense budget because they're not allowed to spend money on defense. Um, 
uh, I think in Germany, again, the picture is a bit more complicated, but suffice it to say, there was also this Wirtschaftswunder, um, which um, returned Germany to the position of being, you know, one of the economic powers uh, within 20 or 30 years of it. Um, the end of the war. So that was interesting. Um, no wonder we get on. We have all this exchange and all these shared experiences. Um, this slide has got some pictures of textbooks. And indeed, there's a lot of German being learned in Japan and a lot of Japanese being learned in Germany, as far as I can tell. Um, the uh, I think there are 91 universities in Germany offering master's courses in Japanese, um, at least two Japanese international schools in Germany. There's a network of German Japanese universities, I think three universities in each country that do research and student exchanges. Um, and as you can imagine, there are numerous museums of Japanese art in uh, Germany. Um, and similarly, if you go to Japan, um, there are many, many places you can study German and many opportunities for seeing German art. Um, there's a, a German culture village in Okinawa with reproductions of various German castles and things, um, but smaller scale things as well. Um, and that's about it. Um, thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions, then I probably won't be able to answer them, but I'm happy to field them and go away and do some more research. Yeah, thank you, Gwen. This was really, really great. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So if you wish, you can stop sharing so that we can see each other. Yep. Uh, yeah. For example, one of my favorite writers, I, I'll start first, is mm -hmm. Haruki Murakami. Oh. I love him. I mean, everything what he writes is nice to me. And I read him, well, I read him in German. Uh, and it sounds so natural, like, yeah, this, you know, it's just it just flows uh, and uh -huh. totally two different languages. But you know, you know, the sentiment is so so close to me. Mm -hmm. And I like to listen, uh, it's really funny, I like to listen, uh, listen Japanese authors, audio books, obviously translated into English because Japanese, it's, I don't know anything. Yeah, yet. yeah so um, your examples were really great and it's interesting to have also a bit of history. Uh, let's see uh, if there were some questions or oh, do you have to click, I'll just go here. Our chat, we have somebody. Uh, I'm, I'm here, at, I'm not in my office, I'm at home. <laughs> so we have, oh, you got a nice thank you from Olympio Gonzalez. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. But please, if you have any questions, you know, it's just pretty much discussion. Um, but what, what made you study Japanese? So why Japan? Why did you, well, you were there eight years. Why didn't you stay? I mean, just curious. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't eight years old in one go. It was um, so my gap year. And then in my degree, uh, I had a term there and then a whole year studying at university in Japan. Um, and then I came back. I qualified as a lawyer and I worked as a lawyer in Japan for a few years. Oh. And then came back again and had small children and went back to Japan and lived there um, as a mom. And in fact, that's when I started translating um, when I was stuck at home with small children. And I never looked back, actually, because I enjoyed it so much. Wow. Um, yeah. And I have to say, every time I left Japan, I cried a lot. I really didn't want to come back. <laughs> but there we are. Yeah. yeah. Walter, Walter has a question. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. I liked it very much. Thank uh, you. Uh, but um, I wondered uh, how come that you, you have a connection with Germany? Are you based in Germany now? Oh, uh, so my mother was from Germany. 
Um, I see. And but but I, now, are you based in, in Düsseldorf? Because this is the center in Germany of the Japanese world. In, in oh, Europe. no, I'm not. I'm based in London at the moment. I see, I see. Yeah. And did you did you um, adopt some of the behavior of Japanese? It seems to me, I have been seeing you for a very few minutes now, or not even, but it seems to me that you may have adopted also Japanese um, behavior a little bit you can't do without it when you when you live there. <laughs> I'm probably not the best judge of that, um, but certainly I found it very. I found it quite easy to integrate. Um, it's. Uh, I suppose I did pick up some Japanese habits. I mean, you're not the first person to have said that. Um, yeah, I, I can. Uh, I can feel yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But this is, the, of course, this is belongs to this, and this is part yeah. of a very interesting side of life. Yeah, it's inevitable. Yeah. 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 We but have. It's also interesting that you are a lawyer as well. So, how did you manage all this? Oh, d at different times. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, not all at once. So, yeah. But it needs these people like you to connect the world. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we have Sheila wanted to ask something, but before yes. we go to Sheila, yeah. Olympia, Olympia wrote something here. Olympia, where are you? Wait, Olympia, you can ask if you want. Would you like to ask? Uh, if you ask, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, okay, thank you. Oh, yes, yeah, Olympia, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Olympia. My, yeah. My question is about beer consumption. Uh, I heard that sometimes it's, you can find Japanese men, I suppose, drunk on the street because they have been drinking too much. Or uh, I wonder if beer has to do with that. Yeah, um, I mean, I just came back from Japan. I didn't oh. see anybody drunk on the street. But I read about this issue of alcohol consumption. Mm. Do you have any information about um, I think the explanation for people sleeping in the street uh, is is twofold. Number one, they can because it's safe. No one's nothing bad is going to happen to them. Japan is a really safe country. Um, and and number two, there's a sort of allergy. There's a like an an en the enzyme that's needed to break down alcohol is is not present in sufficient quantities in the typical Japanese body, so they. Um, have quite low tolerance um, but some people have higher tolerance and if you are unfortunately drinking with someone with the higher tolerance you're tempted to go along with them with terrible consequences I think that's probably the answer I know you can buy it you can buy it uh, right on the street the, the beer they have um, you know dispensers there that you can just buy it straight from the the you know the vending machine the, you know how to, yeah the vending machines exactly yeah. so yeah that's, that makes it easy. very easy, very easy to get hold of yes. uh, beer yes indeed mm -hmm. so we had uh sheila sheila please uh, you're free to ask yeah. uh, yes uh, very interesting thank you going um i spent a lot of time in germany Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I only had one visit to Japan, but oh. I have family connections there through marriages of uh -huh. members of my family. Um, and I stayed with in-laws, as it were, in Japan. And it was fascinating, um, actually, being in a Japanese household. So, yeah, I bet. Uh, and, and I take your point, there are a lot of similarities, but there's one very big difference that's mm. out to me, and that's how non multicultural Japan is. Um, <laughs> and I don't know what the opposite of multicultural is. But um, you, could go, you could go to a massive railway station or something, absolutely teeming with people. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I would stand out like a sore thumb as very very pale and tall and different um but you just don't see lots of people from I think minorities shall we say in Japan and there seems to be a resistance to letting Japan become more multicultural 
I don't know if you have any observations about that. Well, it's hard to say anything that has any sort of academic rigor. <laughs> um, but my, my impression is that there are there are a lot of different Asian communities within Japan. Yeah. And until you've been there for a long time, you don't necessarily become aware. Yeah. So there are many Korean families, for example, that settled after the Korean War. Um, there are families from the Philippines and, you know, there's plenty of Chinese, Taiwanese people. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, they're all getting on with their lives and talking Japanese fluently and you wouldn't necessarily notice Although they don't stand out the way you stand out, you know. Yeah. I, I remember having a funny experience of I, I attempted to do this very difficult exam in Japanese business language. It's called business Japanese, um, which I failed. Um, but I, I remember being in this classroom with a hundred other people, and I was the only person with blonde hair. Everyone else, Korean, Chinese, Taiwanese, um, and I just thought, well, wow, they have a lot of these people have an advantage because they already have Chinese characters in their own script, you know, they have, uh, yeah, I felt, I didn't feel quite so bad. Yeah. but I, So I, I, I think it's more mixed up than it might at, at first seem, is, is what I'm yes. trying to say. Well, I know there are a lot of Chinese tourists, I think Tokyo, uh -huh. um, Kyoto are full of uh, Chinese tourists. Um I can, can at least tell the difference between Chinese and Japanese. <laughs> but I, I understand that Koreans do face a certain amount of prejudice in Japan, so I'm told. I think that's very true, um, unfortunately. And, uh, yeah, it's sort of an ongoing issue. Yeah. But, but, um, to me, like, I, I have no idea <laughs> about it, but why? Is there any reason why would there be prejudice because of history or I know yeah, Japan occupied Korea and they have this kind of I mean I I know Korean culture a little bit better mm -hmm. and it's that um, it's related to the war and what happened that Koreans are reserved toward Japanese and probably the other side will have the similar sentiment I don't know yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, I think you summed it up basically. You know, centuries of uh, aggression, one way or the other. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Yahuza, yeah. you you asked the question, but if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask it too, as you wish. Yahuza Rabbi Yugarba. Hey, Yahuza. Hi. Aha, yeah, we can't hear you. Sorry, I just unmuted myself. I know it's fine. No, it's fine. Thank you. Um, I'm just asking, how did you come up with the Japanese regional cultural diversity? And if there are some instances and experiences you'd like to share with us. So you mean differences in different parts of Japan? Yes, I learned there are some um, differences in regards to the region. That's such an interesting question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the language is very different in different parts of Japan. Um, there are very, very strong regional accents so that when you have the, if you have the news and somebody is reporting from an island apart from the main island, you always get subtitles. Um, so, you know, that's, I, I, I think I like to compare with Switzerland, which has a lot of regional accents as well, because of, and I always think, well, with Switzerland, you've got all these mountains and valleys and the language can't travel as easily. So with Japan, it's, it's islands. Um, people are separated by, you know, these watery passages and, and, and language has just developed kind of differently um, in different places. And if if you're reading Japan, if you're reading any kind of um, fiction Japanese literature that has dialogue, it's very common for a, a certain person to be given an accent from a certain part of the country because it has particular characteristics. And I think you know you, you might do that in English as well. You might want to make a a friendly, generous person. They come from Cornwall, or oh, I don't know. It's all the stereotypes, isn't it, that come out? 
But if you've never been exposed to these different types of Japanese, then it's really hard to understand this this dialogue that's kind of presented in the broad Osaka dialect or broad Okinawan or or something like that. So I would say the language is a huge thing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Then Fiona, you can. Would you like to ask, or shall we read your question? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. I should um, ask. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, actually, I asked a question about food, but before uh -huh. that, because you were talking yeah. about the different regional accents and uh -huh. different speech, I remember somebody once told me that men and women speak a slightly different language. Could you explain about that? Oh, completely different. So um, uh, the verb forms are different and uh, the vocabulary is different and if you've only if you've done a degree course for example where the language instructors tend to be female and um, you hear Japanese men talking for the first time you might really struggle to understand them um, it's yeah it's really pronounced um, and yeah, is what, there a reason for it Yeah, it's, it's the language structure. They have yeah. separate. You know, when you talk to someone who ha is in a higher social scale than you, you speak differently. So they have that a also. Different... That also, but I think the male female thing is not not connected to that. Um, so men tend to they use a simplified verb ending. Um, the word the language is is more cut. It's the, like shorter sounds. It's more abbreviated. I mean, I suppose. It, in English, you might also find that men speak in a slightly more cut way and women might use longer, more flowery phrases. But yeah, in Japanese, it's really, really marked um, to the extent that if you were a man who's only learned to speak with female teachers, people might think that you're gay if you speak in that very female way, because that's the only way that, that you know how to speak. You know, it's it's pretty extreme. Yeah. yeah and I think that um I was also told that little boys speak the female version until they maybe reach seven or eight years of age well they only are in contact with Japanese women at that point in their lives so the nursery teacher the mother the grandmother the aunt you know men are working they don't really do all that much of the child rearing so mm. country you get interested in them you get interested in their culture and you get interested in their history. I think it's quite normal. Yeah. Uh, by the way, when I was in touch very much, uh, I'm a translator of Russian language as well. So a lot of uh, Koreans are in, in, uh, were in the Soviet Union. This has also something oh. to do and still now live in, in, in Russia and in, in other countries, Kazakhstan, for example. So this is also, but, but I have one question that when, uh, because we are often told, and um, Japanese schools are famous for, for 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 requiring very very good uh, grades and very good uh, results, uh, academic results, academic performance. Did you feel a high pressure when you went to school in in Japan, and um, had you had to display? Uh, good academic uh, performances at school, also due to the fact of your neighbors, of your environment requiring this, and this was influencing you as well? That's how, a, how did you experience school? That's an interesting yeah. question. So I was at university in Tokyo for a year, but I was actually in the international division of uh, Waseda University. So they put all the they put the, it was not school. Not school. I no. See. No. Um but and anyway, I, anyway. I I was able to audit the classes of the Japanese students. So I used to go along to some of the ones which interested me. Um and I also had I was writing a like a thesis, an undergraduate thesis. So I had a Japanese professor for that. Um and it's funny, I would say also, from my experience of teaching English in Japan, um, in some things, 
Japanese school is much more rigorous, for example, mathematics and, and things to do with kind of fact learning and, and rote learning and um, these very intense, difficult sort of multiple choice exams just go on for a long time. But when it comes to creative writing and composition or like literary analysis, that's something which they deal with at university. They don't really do that at high school. I hope that's not a massive generalization. It is a bit of a generalization. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's um, it's just a, they, they place value on different things um, in, the, in their education system, I guess. That's quite oh. interesting. And yeah. Sometimes but, it sounds like that it's a school is held to Japanese children. Yeah, there's a lot of cramming and a lot of extra lessons. Maybe it's not, but yeah. uh, sometimes. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, I have, one... uh, I have the impression. Yeah. I have an additional question to that, Walter. It's really good. I noticed that, and, and maybe again, it's just stereotype. Japanese, Koreans, and partly Chinese. No, Chinese is slightly different, but especially Japanese and Koreans, they are not that well at learning foreign languages. Is this, mm -hmm. do you have a feeling that, I mean, is this kind of important or is maybe not so important? So I, I think it's quite hard to get a native teacher in, 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 in many schools. You know, often you're being taught English by a Japanese person. Okay. So I think that's one of the obstacles. Um, and the same with, you know, all the other foreign languages. Because um, I, I never met many Japanese, or, let's say Koreans, Japanese, who would yeah. be, let's say, linguistically, linguistically sophisticated, apart from those who were already working, because I don't know, as yeah. interpreter translator. But in general, when I meet them or see them, they are normally in communities among themselves, mm -hmm. not very extrovert or open. Yeah. And their language skills are not high. Yeah, interesting. Observation. And I've been observing that since 1996. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think what you just said, it, those things maybe go together i mean they're in groups because the, it, they're not brought up to be individuals they everything happens in a group in certainly in japanese society and yeah. so maybe that goes maybe you have to be a pioneer and and try to survive by yourself if you need to if you're ever going to be proficient at a language yeah. in a foreign country that you're living in I don't know. This is just my hypothesis. No, no, no. It's it just, you know, yeah. that's the point of our language society here. We we have this kind of conversations. And yeah. yeah. So, I, I, somebody? I was, yes, I was just Mary, going to say. Mary. All right. Yeah. Uh, very interesting talk, Gwen. Thank you. Very much. Thank enjoyed. you. Thank um, you. I, I had some uh, Japanese contact um, in Southeast London when my children were small, so I'm going back to the uh, second half of the 1980s, early 1990s, there were some Japanese people, a lot of them lived in this area because the men were all working up in London for things like Mitsubishi and that. And uh, I have to say, uh, picking up maybe Walter's point, if I had a Japanese child come home at the invite of my son, I could relax because those children were impeccably behaved. I could mm -hmm. not say the same of some of the English contemporaries. <laughs> any trouble with Yusuke or <laughs> any others. They were wonderful. But I was very impressed by one young woman who uh, she hadn't learnt English in Japan. She'd studied music. She was much younger than me. She was about 22 in the late 80s. And she managed to learn English, although she, her whole culture was sort of dependent on her husband and other Japanese people living in the area. But she managed to acquire quite a bit of English, enough to tell me that she had, had an arranged marriage. Well, my jaw dropped. She was from an educated family and she mm -hmm. had an arranged marriage in 1985 or so. I couldn't uh -huh. believe it. Uh -huh. Other thing that made my jaw drop, again, I'm talking... Mm -hmm. 
lady, she said she thought England was much better for a woman. And she smiled and said, when we live here in London, my husband is always home by midnight. <laughs> Interesting. I found it difficult to respond to that one. And yeah. she explained that that was not always the case when they were living in Japan. And uh, I think there's sort of a culture where the men are expected to stay out, maybe, you know, works outing or whatever. And uh, yeah, but he was always home by midnight and she thought that was just wonderful. Wow. <laughs> That's a low bar. Well, yeah. yeah. I, mean, that, I was intrigued when, uh, on, you know, when you were saying about uh, equality of, of, of work and that she, she, you know, I don't think any of the Japanese uh, ladies that I knew in the 1980s and 1990s had any intention of going to work. Um, mm. it, wasn't, it wasn't part of the culture at all. It was, it was the men who were earning money. And Well, I think all things being equal, you might not choose to live the life of a Japanese man because you might think, oh, my time is better spent bringing up my children um, and developing myself, you know. Yeah. At least you've got time for for hobbies and for friends and for personal interests and things like that if you're the, if you're the carer, whereas if you're a sort of career man, if you're the typical Japanese salary man, then it's just work. Yes. Yeah. Version right then. Yeah. Sadly, I've lost contact with them. Uh, you know, it's a shame, but she she was lovely. She was really wonderful. <laughs> I think they have a Japanese cultural center, or how is it called? Because I there is something, Japanese cultural center or something like that in London. Mm-hmm. They organize a lot of events, a lot of talks. Um, I don't know, I forgot the name. But, is it J- uh, japan house yeah japan house yeah uh-huh. so i think um but the problem is all these great events they take you know they they start at 6 30 in at 6 30 i'm not free i'm still working so i'm like japanese <laughs> man i'm like japanese man oh my gosh my work ethic yeah is by midnight. that's good <laughs> Yeah. So I was really curious because they they offer a lot of cultural related topics where mm-hmm. you can, if you like that type of culture, it's I think it's really great and they they have guests uh you know from all sorts of you know mm-hmm. walks and um from, and it's in central London somewhere I think uh, yeah it is it's in High Street Ken yeah High Street Kensington yeah yeah wonderful yeah so anybody else a question. If not, oh, yes, please, Marit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've just unmuted myself. Um, mm-hmm. So I have worked in a Japanese firm, I've just remembered, mm-hmm. ages ago, uh-huh. um, and it was a shipping company. And uh-huh. I used to get up, get into work just generally quite normal time, 8.30s or so. And my colleagues, the Japanese, <clears throat> I had most of, most of the colleagues were Japanese, and... Um, they were just full on working um, and it was just almost like the losing face thing. Mm. And it was quite a big culture of just working, working, working. And you would leave normal time, maybe half an hour later or even an hour later sometimes. Mm-hmm. And they would still be there. And as soon as I got into the office, most of them were there. They were already working. And some other English colleagues said to me, well, they're there all the time. They're just full on um working and all that and I just couldn't believe it and it was just really scary to think well, one of the other colleagues I worked with he was on the phone constantly okay it's obviously his position as well but I said to him I said do you really like your job and he said yeah I do and he was just constantly on the phone and he mm. said I provide for my family and that's what I do and wow he seemed really sort of committed like from nine till whatever time yeah. or even earlier and it was really scary and I thought gosh I wouldn't want to live his life I think that's what a lot of Japanese women probably think too but yeah. it's kind of traditionally you wouldn't go home before your boss so if your boss is having a long day then you just have to 
think of things to do. That's the <laughs> yeah. culture, isn't it? Do, do mm. would you say that? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, I was working in Tokyo in the early two thousands, and I would say that was definitely that was definitely the case then. Mm. Um, and you know, I don't think working from home has taken off to the same extent that it has in the UK um, post COVID. Partly because people just live in quite small apartments, and and partly because of this emphasis on being present and being there as long as your boss and so on. Um, yeah, I think you yeah. could just grow up with it, and it's just normal then, isn't it? It's just normal. It's just normal. Yeah, yeah. Totally. it's really interesting. When I was saying before, I did a little search on Amazon about you know books about comparing Japan and Germany, and there's quite a few that are kind of how come the Germans work so much fewer hours than us and are still so successful? <laughs> mm. <laughs> that, you know, so it's obviously, it's it's a topic of debate and discussion mm. for them as well. well. Yeah. They specifically. But, I mean, is it, do you need really to work that hard in order to survive or maintain or support a family? Because it's so expensive or is it not so expensive and that, People just like working. Gosh, I think there would be just like between London and the regions, you know how London is much more expensive yeah, for, for right. everything. I, I think same in Tokyo. If you don't have to live in Tokyo, then go and live in some small civilized castle town where the rent is cheaper and the pace of life is slower. Um and um, certainly where I lived most recently, uh, we were in Shizuoka Prefecture and it was a very relaxed pace of life because there were there was a lot of agriculture or like light industry and it wasn't the same work every, we'll work every day that, that, uh, that work every hour that you, that you can. It was, yeah, it was different. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. Grant, thank you so, so much for that. So thank you think, as every single time we got some thank yous in in our chat uh so walter we almost managed this year we have one more event left and that's on the 14th. yes in december Four, is it 14th everybody's think... welcome to yeah. join us in, in uh december and we're going to collect or to to be open for recipes for cakes or yeah we have it? Okay, actually, the event is called Cakes and Bacon, Baking Cookies. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, it's on the page, right? And the idea is that, oh, I mean, we, we want to exchange recipes, and this is multilingual thing. So it doesn't matter which language you speak, we speak cookies. Everybody <laughs> understands that. <laughs> so we'll, we'll share recipes, and those who are ambitious, I'll try to be ambitious, we'll even bake some cookies and, well, we can't really share them all, and but we can show them. So, so that's the idea. Of well, our I, I, can I just um? Sure. Can I, hey, can I, I ask a question? It's quite hard to hear myself with the headphones in, but I was just um trying to be thoughtful and wanted to ask Gwen, although I completely missed the film, um, what she thought. What what is the typical kind of um activity for a family in Japan? What what would a family do? Would they spend their time on the internet? Would they spend their time going for walks? What's what's core and typical family life like in wow. Japan? Like for for parents with young children. Parents with young children. Mm. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of trips to playgrounds or to picnics. Um, meeting up with other I mean I suppose as what a mother would do with her small children is typically meet up with other mothers and small children and whether that's to go to a play center or a children's museum or a picnic or a walk um, if it's the whole family maybe they'll go and see some baseball together or um, yeah I suppose different things for different times of year mm. um there's a much more of an awareness of the seasons in japan than 
there is over here and certain things belong to different times of year so in the summer there's a lot of incredible fireworks displays um so that would be definitely a family thing to do and then in the autumn you go for a walk to see the autumn colors because the the trees change color in a very dramatic way and then in the spring is the cherry blossoms and everyone is having picnics underneath the the cherry blossoms mm. um so mm. yeah i mean not that different to here i don't <laughs> think um so very different well yeah i mean if people don't tend to have each other round because they live in small houses so if you get together with another family maybe you'll go out for sushi or um or you go out to a restaurant together yeah i've been um fascinated uh by the uh i'm, I'm a little bit of a biologist uh -huh. so um the giant tuna fish like, fascinated me uh -huh. because they only exist off the coastline of the islands of japan right so it's a very uh a very uh, neutral point of view but um they're quite amazing if you think of a normal tuna fish is about i don't know a, a, you know less than half a meter 30 centimeters something like that and the giant japanese tuna fish which are naturally occurring are about um from what i see uh on visual reports five to ten meters in height um three or four meters tall uh wide from from the tip of their uh you know face to the yeah. tip of their tail they're about five to ten meters in in distance which is a uh, a very unusual characteristic for a species that everybody knows around the world. So that that's incredible to me, really. Yeah, and I believe they can fly out of the the ocean and and uh, attract attention in in those sorts of ways. But the the fact that they're giant <coughs> is um, giant fish is remarkable. Nowhere it, it's it doesn't occur anywhere else in the world. I didn't realize that. I mean, I've certainly seen tuna for sale at the fish market. That's pretty memorable. You know, you see them all lined up. The small ones, the giant ones are like something like you wouldn't believe from a science fiction film. Wow. Unbelievable. You take an average salmon and then enlarge it, you know, sort of 3000% and it's the same breed and everything. Wow. Really amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I don't. I yeah, I don't know if anyone else has considered that. But yeah, they exist. Then. Nice. Okay, so I think that's it. I wish you a really nice evening, and with Walter, we'll then announce a few new events for the next year. I know we'll have few in English. So you're welcome. It's all on this GS, German Language Society page. And uh, yeah, thank you and have a nice evening. And I hope to see you soon. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks thank a lot you. for having me. Oh, thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, Romy. Thank Bye. You. See you. Also, everybody who joined us. Yeah. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.